third talk this morning will come from Andy Davies, a research director, as you see up there, from NCC Group, and it's entitled Fuzzing the Easy Way Using Zulu. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Everyone hear me okay? Great. Okay. So, quick show of hands. Who has performed fuzzing at some point or other during their life? Great. We've got the right people in the room. Okay. So, what is Zulu? Well, it's a fuzzer. Um, it's an interactive GUI-based fuzzer written in Python. Um, the primary um, facet of Zulu is it's incredibly easy to use. It's as much as possible input and output agnostic. So the idea was to, once, once we developed the uh, kind of easy to use engine, you can then modularize it and add modules to fuzz different things um, using the same kind of understanding of how the, the engine works. And um, as well as being very straightforward and kind of easy to use from a GUI perspective, if you want to do something that's a bit more complicated, it's also extendable and scriptable to do more complicated things. So lots of you have, have performed fuzzing over the years. I found that the way that I normally approached fuzzing on client engagements over the years was developing bespoke fuzzer scripts as I went along to perform <coughs> fuzzing against certain protocols. And the reason that I did that is um, I find it very kind of quick and easy uh, with regard to specifics that I wanted to do on jobs, but I found that I would probably be wasting quite a lot of time because I'd be doing the same thing over and over again, but just applying it to different um, protocols on different jobs. There's lots of fuzzing frameworks out there, um, things like Peach and uh, Sully and you know, lots and lots of other ones. But generally, they tend to have a reasonable, reasonably steep learning curve. Um, you also need to have an understanding of programming. With these fuzz fuzzing frameworks, admittedly, once you get going with them, uh, you can create some very, very powerful fuzzers. But um, they should be quick and easy to set up for situations where you just want to fuzz a specific protocol in a specific way. Um, so I wanted to come up with a point and click sol solution that you could use in addition to these fuzzing frameworks. It's not intended to replace them, it's intended to make fuzzing more accessible. Um, having said that, as I've mentioned, I wanted to make it um, scriptable so you could add more complexity if you needed to. <coughs> so, it's a very straightforward, simple GUI. The idea is it's kind of, it acts like a proxy and uh, you use the conventional client tool that, you're, um, that will connect to some kind of server component and you're sitting in the middle with, with Zulu and manipulating that data, be it text-based or uh, binary-based protocols. So it's kind of like a, if you take the same kind of approach as a, um, a web proxy, which I'm sure anyone who does any kind of application security testing has used, it's taking exactly the same approach, but applying it to uh, any kind of protocol, and depending on the modules that you have available to you, um, all kinds of different technologies. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So it represents the data in a, in a simple way, shows you um, the, the data in a, a packetized format. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how I've kind of applied that to non-packetized data when I get into some of the modules. Um, but the idea is it sh simply shows you the data that you've captured between a client and a server and allows you to modify and fuzz that data. Um, there's also a, a console displaying all the information that's <coughs> also getting logged out to a, a separate file. So the first and most simple um, module that I wanted to, to develop was just proxy-based networking. So you've got a network client talking to a network server, um, 
any kind of protocol, binary or, or uh, ASCII-based, and being able to capture some of that data and then <coughs> iterate through lots of fuzz test cases. <coughs> Excuse me. So, basically you set up the proxy settings um, that'll start up a local proxy on your machine. In this instance, we're using um, Windows Terminal Services. And uh, you start the network capture and it'll be listening. You then use your conventional client that you've got and talk to your proxy on the local machine and start that network capture. And as you can see, you've got the packets uh, coming in in real time that are displayed underneath. When you then stop that network capture, um, it will display each of the packets and the data input um, data bytes at the bottom. And it's literally a case of highlighting the bytes that you want to be able to manipulate. You can right click on there and add a fuzz point, as you can see in that diagram there. And then once you've selected a fuzz point, you need to uh, decide how you're going to mutate that data within your fuzzer. So I've used <coughs> the open source FuzzDB as the basis for the mutators. We've added a, a bunch of other mutators to that FuzzDB. And it's literally a case of um, ticking the checkboxes of the different mutators you want to use with your traffic. And to the right of the text-based ones, rather than the ones that are kind of calculated on the fly, uh, you can see a little icon. If you click on that, it'll spawn Notepad, and you, you can actually see the contents of each of those uh, lists <coughs> of mutators, which you can then just modify um, using that process. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. You, you then need to te tell it the output method. As I said, it's kind of input and output um, agnostic. So you could actually, theoretically, capture a whole load of network packets and then send them to a, um, a process that's expecting a file. Or you know, depending on what modules you've got, it doesn't have to be the same module that it's getting sent out to. But in this instance, it's kind of important that you're sending it. Um, to a, a, an RDP server because that's what you're trying to fuzz. So um, you select the information associated with the target server and uh, click OK. And it starts fuzzing and uh, goes off and you know, iterates through all the different mutators that you've selected uh, <coughs> based on that, that information that you've provided. One thing I didn't mention uh, when you're selecting which packets you want to fuzz, you can actually select packets to be sent unmodified. So if you only want to uh, manipulate, say, the third or fourth packet within an interaction, you can send the first few unmodified and then just fuzz the next one after that. So um, it'll tell you when the target's crashed based on the, uh, the instrumentation for that module in the network uh, uh, module. If it cannot communicate with the service any longer, it makes the assumption that that target has crashed. Now, um, you want to be able to instrument <coughs> the, the, the crash and find out what caused it and you know, how you can repeat that. So when a crash occurs, uh, you get this uh, orange icon appear in the, the top left and the, uh, uh, sorry, top middle and, and bottom right. And um, it tells you that the, the target stopped responding. But instead of stopping the fuzz run, it pauses at that point. Because if it's a, a false positive and you've manually checked and the service is still running, you could just hit go and it'll continue from where it left off rather than having to go back to the beginning again. But the cool thing um, about the fact that it, when it crashes and it realizes that it crashes, it creates a proof of concept um, test case based on the data that was supplied in the previous test case. Now, it's making the assumption here that um, the test case that was sent prior to the time when the host appeared to stop responding was the data that caused the crash. That's not necessarily always going to be the case, but it's a reasonable assumption to make. So based on that data that was provided within the previous test case, what Zulu does is it creates a proof of concept uh, Python script, including that data, and <coughs> if you've set up um, the uh, information within the uh, SMTP settings, which I'll show you a bit later on, it will email you that proof of concept. So that's quite cool. You know, you can set your fuzzer going, go to the pub, 
and wait for the emails to come in while you're in the pub with all the proof of concept sent as attachments to the emails. So when you get back home, you can then just try each of those Python scripts and uh, hopefully they'll replicate the crashes that occurred. So um, other inputs. Rather than actually using a, um, a, a real client and a, uh, a real server, perhaps you've captured some data and you want to use that um, PCAP file as the input. <coughs> so if you use Wireshark, capture the, the data associated with uh, the TCP stream that you, you want to be able to fuzz. You need to follow the TCP stream within Wireshark so you're not fuzzing all kinds of random data that you've captured on the network, only the stuff that you want to fuzz. And um, you can then import that PCAP file associated with the TCP stream and um, it will display it in a similar way to if you just captured it as we'd seen before. There's also a, uh, a file module what the, the way that this kind of works is that I, I started off with the, the network module because it was the, the, the most obvious thing to, uh, to kind of get the engine developed and the user interface and that kind of thing. And as soon as people started using that like the, within the company, because we've had this for about 18 months now and been using it internally, um, <coughs> people, would say, people would say, oh, can you just do this? Can you just add this module? Or oh, we want this module as well. So it's kind of like developed organically module by module based on requirements. And also the, the user interface has been developed, <coughs> kind of expanded and enhanced as we've gone along as well. So obviously the ability to fuzz input files um, against a target process is pretty useful, so I added that as a module. So it's literally just a case of um, importing a file and uh, selecting the file fuzzer. You specify the, um, the process that you want to, um, to fuzz against and how long you want that to, to run for each time it's spawned how you want it to shut down each time if it hasn't <coughs> been killed as a result of the, uh, the malformed data that you've provided. And um, <coughs> if, a, if a crash occurs, there's a built-in debugger using PyDebug so that it gives you some uh, further information that might assist you in triaging the bug. Um, you might have seen some of the research that I've done into USB over the last few years. And um, one of the <coughs> excuse me, one of the obvious things to add as a module was USB from my perspective. So I used to have a, a tool that I developed as a standalone tool called Frisbee that would interface to a commercial piece of test equipment that would allow you to capture um, data associated with the enumeration phase of USB when you plug the device in and then manipulate that, that data and create a uh, what's called a generator script within this piece of te test equipment and uh, simulate the insertion and the uh, enumeration phase of, of the USB device. So I use the same kind of process uh, within a module within Zulu. So <coughs> Unfortunately, you do need to have this specific bit of test equipment if you want to use the USB functionality, um, but it's, it's one of the good ways of, of testing USB and it's not particularly expensive equipment. So after you've done your capture within, uh, within the test equipment interface and created the generator script, you can then import that into Zulu and um, those packets are then represented in a similar way within the interface and allow you to you know, um, select data and create fuzz points in, in exactly the same way as if it was network data. And um, it then <coughs> replays that generator script each time. Um, ah, missed a bit. Before we do that, uh, <coughs> the way the triage works, or the way the, the instrumentation works rather, is because the vast majority of times when you get a, uh, when you identify a bug associated with USB, you're going to get either a kernel panic or a blue screen. So using IP 
Um, so pinging the device is a, a reasonable way to see if the target stopped responding. So you do that by just supplying an IP address and make sure that your target device that you're fuzzing over USB is also connected to uh, the same IP network. And then <coughs> when you run the, uh, the fuzz run, Zulu then controls the, um, the user interface that's connected to that USB test equipment and manipulates the data and, <laughs> and injects that data into the enumeration phase of USB over and over again, so simulating the insertion of the device. Somebody then said, what about serial? Serial would be good. I thought, well, yeah, serial would be quite good to fuzz, but it's, it's not really packet-based, it's asynchronous, so we might have to think about how we're gonna represent this data. Um, but it would certainly be useful from a fuzzing perspective as quite a few bugs have been found uh, within the uh, Hayes AT command set in mobile devices, modems, that kind of thing. So the ability to fuzz serial um, and, and also a, a lot of kind of um, network test equipment that's got console inputs and things like that. Uh, it's something that um, I'm not aware of specific fuzzers or fuzzing module for other fuzzing frameworks have, have got. So I thought, yeah, let's develop that as well. So the way that it works is there's a, um, a serial terminal program built into Zulu. So what you do is you set up your port settings and you connect to uh, the device that you want to test via serial from that terminal emulator within the tool and it captures all the data um, as a result of your, your interactions with it. And the way, <coughs> excuse me, the way that I've represented the data, even though it's asynchronous, is using carriage returns to delimit the data into packets, even though they're not really packets, but it's a good way of representing it in a common format, similar to the, the way I've represented the other data within the tool, um, and it seems to work pretty well. So there you can see I've connected to a modem, uh, entered ATI1 as a AT command, and uh, <coughs> that's then represented at the bottom as a packet that you can then you know, select that data and, and, and manipulate it in, in the way that you do any other packet. Um, and once you set up your first point, you um, point it back at the device that you're testing and, uh, and set it running. Again, you can use IP for the instrumentation to determine whether the device has crashed or not. So Wireshark integration. I've talked about using Wireshark with regard to PCAP captures, um, but what would be really useful is if you're capturing data from a, between a, a network client and a network server, and it's a protocol that you uh, don't have the spec for, or you don't have very much information about, or you're not really aware of, of, of that protocol, but you know there's a Wireshark dissector for it, what you can do is you can enable Wireshark integration um, by clicking that tick box and telling it where the Wireshark binary is. And then <coughs> when you then start your network proxy and capture the data bef between your client and the server, um, it will capture all the packets, and at the point where you stop the capture and it displays all those packets, it will automatically generate a PCAP file, supply that to Wireshark and spawn Wireshark, so that you've then got the dissector being used to pull out all the information within those network packets and provide you a, a much better idea of where within those packets you might want to set your fuzz points. Now, if you're, if you're testing a network service or a, um, a process that you're fuzzing with files, <coughs> chances are you're gonna be running those within a VMware environment rather than um, certainly not on the same box that your fuzz is running on, because that would be very foolish. Um, you may be running on separate hardware, but chances are you'll probably be fuzzing processes within a VM. So we want to be able to control VMware with Zulu. <coughs> and what you can do
you might have situations where a crash doesn't actually restart a process, it freezes it, and that process needs to be restart, restarted. Similarly, you might have some kind of fuzz case that will cause an OS to hang, and the, uh, the whole OS needs to be restarted. So via the VMware settings, what you can do is you can specify control of either the process that you're fuzzing or the OS on which a process uh, that's being fuzzed uh, resides. You can then tick that enable VMware integration button and uh, allow it to control it automatically based on uh, when it's detected that a crash has occurred. said that one of the primary drivers behind the tool was to make fuzzing more accessible and easier to use and get up to speed for, for people who've never done fuzzing before. And um, a good example of that within the GUI is some of the things that you can easily do with a few clicks. Like, um, let's say you've used your Wireshark integration and you know that the first four bytes are a length field relating to the remaining data. So you can just highlight those bytes, right click and say add a length field determine whether you want it to be a big endian or a little endian uh, length, and you then highlight the remainders of the bytes, and then Zulu will automatically represent that as a length field. So if you've got your fuzz point, which is uh, the, the, the value in orange there, um, <coughs> if the mutator that you've chosen is variable size, then the length will automatically be calculated for each of the um, test cases that, that run within the fuzzer. Because a lot of protocols, if that length field was incorrect, it wouldn't even get to the point where it was processing the data that you'd supplied in your fuzz case. So you need to make sure that gets fixed up, and Zulu does that automatically for you. I mentioned about email alerts. So if you want it to email you and send you the proof of concept, you need to set your email notification settings uh, with all your SMTP details. And um, if, if you've moved on from the kind of simple GUI side of things and you want to expand it using ZuluScript, ZuluScript is just Python, um, but it's the ability to process a packet after the mutator but before being processed by the target. So, you know, you might have situations where um, you might need to apply something like a data transform, something might need to be compressed, or a checksum needs to be calculated, that kind of thing. That can all done in, be done in Zulu script. Um, and it's literally a case of ticking that tick box. You modify a, a specific Python file, and you can insert your, your code in there, and that will be executed for every time that the, uh, the fuzz, a different fuzz case is executed. And there's some sample code in there just as a simple content length field for uh, HTTP just to show you how to write the code. So it has found a number of reasonably high profile bugs um, over the last couple of years. Like I said, we've been using it internally for <coughs> at least 18 months um, in various guises. It's been kind of uh, improved and expanded upon but um, those are a few of the bugs that it's found that have um, been publicized. There's, there's lots of others that are still being worked on by vendors. And if you'd like a copy of it, it's available on our GitHub page. So you can download it from there. Thanks very much.